State your name and spell it for the record, please. Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y, Cruz, K-R-U-S-E. Go ahead, counsel. Thank you. Ms. Cruz, what is your present title? I am a forensic pathologist at the Iowa Office of the State Medical Examiner. And Dr. Cruz, um, where did you grow up? I grew up in San Diego, California. And you indicated what your title is. Would that be fair to say that you're a doctor? Yes. And what are you a doctor of? I'm a doctor of forensic pathology. And where did you go to school? I went to undergraduate school at Tulane University. It's in New Orleans, and I majored in anthropology. And I went to medical school at St. George's University. It's in Grenada, West Indies. And did you complete a fellowship or residency? I did. I did an anatomic and clinical pathology residency at St. Barnabas Medical Center, which is in Livingston, New Jersey. And I did a forensic pathology fellowship afterward at the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner of Maryland, which is in Baltimore, Maryland. So who are you currently employed by? By the Iowa Office of the State Medical Examiner. And where is your office located? It's located in Ankeny, Iowa. And what is your actual specialty? My actual specialty is forensic pathology, which is a subspecialty of pathology. What is pathology? Pathology is a subset of medicine where we study injury and disease processes and how those affect the human body. And how long have you been employed where you're currently employed? I've been at the State Medical Examiner since July 2018. And you are licensed to practice medicine? Correct. And in what states are you licensed? In Iowa. And are you a board certified forensic pathologist? I am. I'm okay. board certified in anatomic, clinical, and forensic pathology. I know you told us what pathology is. Mm -hmm. What's forensic pathology? So forensic pathology specifically looks at autopsies and how we use autopsies to determine cause and manner of death. Approximately how many autopsies have you performed in your career? As of today, I performed 606 autopsies. Doctor, what is an autopsy? An autopsy is a post-mortem examination of a deceased individual where we collect evidence, identify any injury, as well as disease processes that could lead to someone's death. And from that, we determine the cause of death and the manner of death. Your Honor, at this time, I would ask that Dr. Cruz be qualified as an expert in the area of forensic pathology. Mr. Firehelm? No objection. Okay. Granted. Thank you, Your Honor. And Dr. Cruz, do you... Um, we're going to talk about an autopsy that you performed on Amy Mullis. Mm -hmm. And do you, did you uh, generate a report regarding that autopsy? I did. And would that report aid you in your testimony today? Yes, it would. Your Honor, I would ask that Dr. Cruz be allowed to refer to her report if she need to. That's fine. You can. Thank you. Now, Dr. Cruz, you explained to us what an autopsy is. And you um, can you explain to us how you actually perform an autopsy? Sure. So first, the deceased person is brought into our office, and we weigh them and we measure them in length. Then they're brought into the autopsy suite, and we look and see if they have any clothing. If they do have clothing, we document that clothing, we take photographs, and then we remove the clothing. Once the clothing's removed, we look for any evidence of medical therapy. If they have any tubes in their mouth or any vascular catheters, we document those, and then we remove those as well. Once all the extra things that are on the body have been removed, then we start our external examination. Here we go, top to bottom, and we're looking for any sort of defining characteristics, such as hair color, hair length, eye color. We look to see if the person has any tattoos, if they've had any surgeries and have subs subsequent scars. Then we also look for any evidence of injury. We document the injury, we take photographs. Once we're done with that external examination, we start our internal examination. So we perform a surgical Y-shaped incision, which is in the chest and the abdomen, and we reflect back the skin. That way we can look at the internal organs. Once we can see all the internal organs, we take, take each organ out one by one, we weigh each organ, and then we look for any evidence of injury or disease in those organs themselves. We also remove the brain as well. 
during the internal examination, we'll usually take fluids, we'll take blood, we'll take vitreous fluid from the eye, we'll take urine if it's available, and we'll send that for toxicology testing. Dr. Cruz, did you perform an autopsy on Amy Mullis? I did. And was that performed on November 12th, 2018? It was. Where was it performed? It was performed at the Iowa Office of the State Medical Examiner in Ankeny, Iowa. Who was present for the autopsy that you performed? So Travis Simasath with the Delaware County Sheriff's Office was present at the autopsy, as well as four autopsy technicians who are employed by our office to assist with the autopsy process. And how, if you can just briefly describe, how is the body brought to your facility for that autopsy? So for each county, we service most of the counties in Iowa. Each county uses a different method uh, to transport the body to our office. Some use funeral homes, some use ambulances. I'm not sure exactly in this case which one was used. But it would have been one of those ways. Exactly. And prior to performing this autopsy, what information did you have? So when an autopsy is called into our office, we'll get a little snippet of what kind of case it is. So I did know that this a woman was coming in who had reportedly been impaled with a corn rake. Uh, also, prior to the examination, I talked to Dr. Thompson. He is a county medical examiner. Each county has their own medical examiner who's not a forensic pathologist like me. Um, they can be an emergency medicine physician or a family practice physician. They'll triage cases and do examinations for us out in the field and aid us um, with our process. So I spoke to Dr. Thompson, and he also informed me there was a woman who had been impaled with a rake, and he expressed concern for the amount of injuries she showed both blunt force injuries as well as six puncture wounds on her back when the corn rake had four tines in it. Now you a moment ago briefly described what you do when you're conducting an autopsy. Yes. Is that what you did in this case? I did. So what would you, what part of that ex the exam for the autopsy would you have performed first? So first Ms. Mullis was brought in, we weighed and we measured her she was not wearing clothing. Her clothing was brought separately, so we didn't have to remove any. Um, we did look at the clothing that she came with. They were all in separate bags. We photographed and documented them. Uh, she had a number of emergency therapy devices on her. Those were all documented and removed. I did a thorough uh, external examination as well as a thorough internal examination. We also did toxicology testing on her. She did not have urine, so we just did it on blood and the vitreous fluid from the eyes. And when you say an external examination, I know you indicated earlier that's a pretty much top to bottom observation. Correct. At some point, do you also take photographs? We do. We take photographs of anything we deem important. We'll take photographs of tattoos, of scars, and obviously any injury that we saw. And there were a number of injuries on Miss Mullis that we took photographs of. And Doctor, you did in fact take photographs, as you just indicated, of Ms. Mullis. Correct. Your Honor, may I approach? Yes. Doctor, did you have the opportunity to look through those pictures? I did. And are those the pictures that were taken of Amy Mullis's body on November 12th, 2018? They were of her body and some evidence as well. And are they a true and accurate uh, representation of her body as well as the other items that you described? Yes. And before we get to the pictures, mm -hmm. um, when you first performed the exam, did you initially, or I'm sorry, did you also uh, photograph the clothing? Yes, we did. And you indicated other evidence. Was there anything else you also photographed? The corn rake, corn rake in question was also photographed. And you indicated what you do with the um, external exam. What do you do with the internal exam, specifically in this case? So specifically in this case, since she had a number of external injuries, I wanted to look closely and see if any of those injuries corresponded to injuries on, in the internal organs as well. Um, the injuries were confined, the penetrating injuries were confined to the chest region. So I did identify some injury to the lungs um, as well, as well as blood in the chest cavities. Doctor, I believe you indicated at some point in an autopsy, you generally look if there's any natural diseases. Correct. In this case, were you able to determine if there was any natural diseases? In Ms. Mullis' liver, she had a small cyst, just a little opening with some fluid in it. It was benign. Did you believe that to be fatal in any way? No. Your Honor, at this time, I would ask that a State's Exhibits 49 through 65 be admitted into evidence.
Any objection? No, Your Honor. 49 through 65 are admitted. And Your Honor, at this time I would ask to publish them to the jury. I will let you publish. Again, anyone who doesn't want to see these pictures or doesn't think they can see them, I'll give you a minute to either leave the courtroom or stand on this side of the courtroom. Uh, counsel, you can go ahead and publish. Uh, Dr. Cruz, you talked about some of Amy's injuries that you yes. photographed. Um, I'm going to show you sorry, Exhibit 49. Is this a photograph of Amy Mullis from that day? Yes, it is. And I uh, see here um, there is a what appears to be a ruler on her chest. Yes. And what does that ind indicate to you? So we use a ru ruler for scale, and we also have a number on the ruler. That's our internal office number for organizational purposes, showing the year and what number autopsy she was that year. And that's what's listed on that ruler? Correct. Now, um, can you describe what you see in this picture, please? So on each of our decedents, we take a photograph. We call it an identification photograph. We want just a photograph of the face. So this shows Miss Mullis's face. Coming out of the corner of her mouth is a breathing tube that was inserted during emergency therapy. Um, and you can also see some injuries on her face as well. And in this photograph, where do you see injuries on her face? So she has a small abrasion or a scrape in the middle of her upper lip. And she also has a much larger abrasion or a scrape on the, her left, left side of her chin with a surrounding contusion or a bruise. I'll show you state's exhibit number 50. What is this a photograph of? So this is a closer up photograph of the lower half of Miss Mullis's face on the left side. Again, showing that abrasion of the scrape in the upper lip and that abrasion and contusion on the left side of the jaw. Now, we heard yesterday from Dr. Thompson, but just um, so that everybody's clear, what's an abrasion? So an abrasion is a scraping of the skin that removes the top part of the skin, and it's indicative of blunt force injury. So you have an object that has a blunt sur surface to it, and the impact from that scrapes off that top layer of skin. And what is a contusion? Contusion is also a bruise, which also comes from a blunt object and that indicates there's bleeding in the surrounding skin so from that impact the blood vessels vessels burst and cause that bleeding. Now I believe you indicated blunt force injury or blunt force trauma. Mm -hmm. What is that? So blunt force trauma comes from a blunt object and it indicates crushing or tearing or scraping of the skin from the impact of that object. Now Dr. Um, I'm showing you ex people, I'm sorry, state's exhibit number 51. What's in this photograph? So this is a close-up photograph of Miss Mullis's ear. On the top part of the ear, there's an abrasion or a scrape. And also on the earlobe and in front of the ear, we see more contusions or bruises. She also had contusions and bruises behind the ear as well. Were you able to get a photograph of the um, contusions and abrasions and behind this ear? No, we did not have a photograph behind the ear. And you indicated those were, I'm sorry, were those abrasions or contusions behind? There were contusions behind the ear. She had earrings in when she came to our office, so it's reasonable to consider that her earrings hitting her ear or the back of her head could have caused that bruising. Now I'll show you uh, State's Exhibit number 52. What is this a photograph of? This is more far away photograph of the top half of Miss Mullis when she, after she was cleaned and her medical therapy was removed. We can again see that blunt force injury on the face, on the lips, on the side of the jaw. And now we can see more injury on her upper chest and the top of her right breast. Um, there's a bit of asymmetry too to her breasts um, because her right breast implant was injured during the penetrate, one of the penetrating wounds that entered her back. No, I'll show you People's Exhibit number, I'm sorry, State's Exhibit 53. Is this a close-up of her chest area? Correct. This is a close-up of the chest, <laughs> highlighting those abrasions and those contusions or bruises that were on her chest and the top part of her breast. And can you tell what these injuries are on her chest or where they came from? So they, again, indicate some sort of blunt force injury. Uh, it could be during some sort of struggle, really any sort of impact with a blunt object. I can't say with absolute certainty where they came from, but they are a blunt force injury. 
Doctor, I'll show you State's Exhibit Number 54. What is this a photograph of? So this is a close-up photograph of Ms. Mullis's right hand. She has a number of abrasions or scrapes and contusions and bruises on the back part of her hand and in the knuckle <coughs> region. And State's Exhibit Number 55. This is a close-up photograph of her left hand. She has a few more of these abrasions or scrapes and also some bruising as well on the back side of her hand in, in the knuckle region. These could potentially reflect defensive type wounds from a struggle. And state's exhibit number 56. What is this a photograph of? This is a close-up photograph of Ms. Mollis's right knee. She again has more abrasions and contusions on the right knee. State's exhibit number 57. This is her left knee. She has some larger abrasions or scrapes and multiple contusions as well. Now, Doctor, we've talked about blunt force trauma. Can you explain what sharp force injuries or trauma is? So in contrast to blunt force, we have a blunt object essentially hitting the skin. Sharp force penetrates the skin and cuts and divides as it moves through your body. You tend to have longer sort of injuries with a sharp force injury. We classically think of knives and things like that, but really anything that would be able to cut and divide the skin would be considered a sharp object. Now, throughout your exam, did you then um, perform an examination of Amy's back? I did. I'm showing you uh, people's exhibit, I'm sorry, state's exhibit number 58. What is this a photograph of? So this is a photograph mostly of the right side of her back and the right side of her chest. Her right arm is in that top right portion of the picture. And here we see multiple sharp force injuries that I identified at autopsy. And here, Dr. Cruz, how many blood, or I'm sorry, sharp force injuries do you see? We see a total of six, which was the number that I, I identified at autopsy. And just so we're clear, there's one right on, um, underneath, or on the picture on the right side, a small uh, one underneath that appears to be arm. Yeah, under, in, under the armpit area, she had one. Doctor, I'm going to show you uh, State's Exhibit number 59. What is this a photograph of? So this is another photograph of the right side of her chest. Now in the rightmost portion of the picture, that's a chest tube. An incision was created and a tube was inserted during emergency therapy. And that's to get any sort of blood out that's potentially in her chest cavity. So that's not considered a wound. But right to the left of it is a sharp force injury. And then would it be fair to say that you, the, the one you just... Uh, described, you go to the left of that and you see a second one? I do. So the first one, um, the first one on the right entered the chest cavity through the ribs, and that's the one that also exited the chest cavity on the anterior surface and punctured the right breast and breast implant. Then if you go more to the left, above the M on the ruler is a second sharp force injury. In my report, just for the purpose of organization, I gave, made them A, B, C, and D. So the first one on the very right, I called puncture wound A. Then on the left, more left to it is puncture wound B. So puncture wound B, entered the soft tissue and the chest cavity in between the ribs as well. This one hit the right lung in two different spots. Then it continued on and went through the diaphragm, which is a bit of muscle that separates your chest cavity and your abdominal cavity. It went through the diaphragm and it also punctured the liver as well. Now, so, if you keep going, do you see then what you classified as puncture wound C? I do. So keep going left from puncture wound B are, is C, they're two almost on top of each other. C is on the top and D is on the bottom. Would it be so, fair to see, say that according to the picture, C is a little bit smaller than D? Yes, it does look smaller. And what, um, what observations did you make in your exam of puncture wound C? So puncture wound C injured the soft tissue of the back of the chest, the skin, the subcutaneous tissue or the tissue right under the skin and the muscle of the back, but it did not enter the chest cavity. And if you then go right underneath and a little bit to the left of that, would that be puncture wound D? Yeah, right below it. So you have that long kind of reddish line. That's an abrasion or a scrape. At the bottom of that is puncture wound D. And like puncture wound C, puncture wound D only injured soft tissue. It did not enter the chest cavity. Would, D, would it be fair to say that D then would be the, the lowest puncture wound that we see at this time? Correct.
and um, puncture wound E, which one would you describe that being? So at the very top part of the picture, you see uh, the lat, little bottom part of the last puncture wound, not counting that one, the leftmost puncture wound next to C. Um, is puncture wound E. So puncture wound E did enter the chest cavity, but instead of the right side of the chest, it entered the left side of the chest. It went through the soft tissue in between two ribs on the left side of the chest. And it was actually so close to the spine region that it injured part of a vertebral body or that bone that makes up the spine um, and injured a part of that as well before it entered the left side of the chest. Now, doctor, all the way up at, um, of exhibit 59 on the, on the top near the right side, do you see the edge of what you describe as puncture wound F? Yeah, F, F actually was the only one that was on the left side of the back, and F entered the skin, the soft tissue, and it entered the left chest cavity as well. Neither the ones that entered the left chest cavity injured organs in that cavity, but they did enter the cavity. Now, doctor, I'm going to show you uh, state's exhibit number 60. Is this a, a different view of the puncture wounds? This one is. You can't see the one that's underneath her armpit very well, but you can see better the one on the left side of the chest that entered the left chest cavity. So you see five of the total six puncture wounds. So in this photograph, we don't see what you classified as puncture wound A that's near that chest tube underneath her right arm. Exactly. But you do see the other five. Correct. Now, doctor, based on your exam, could you tell which puncture wound was fatal? So technically, any sort of penetrating wound, like a puncture wound, can be fatal. You can get an infection that can lead to your death that way. In terms of a more rapidly fatal wound, the four puncture wounds that entered her chest cavity were more likely to contribute to her death. So that would be A, B, E, and F. Now, based on your exam, could you tell the direction of the wound paths? So there were two different directions of the six puncture wounds. The rightmost wounds, A, B, C, and D, so the one by her chest tube underneath her armpit, the one left to it, and then the two that are on top of each other, those all go from back to front. So when we describe direction, we do it in terms of anatomic position. So anatomic position is with the person standing straight, looking straight forward with their feet forward. And then their hands are down by their side with their palms out, and so your thumbs are facing out. So with Miss Mullis in that position, those four wounds went back to front, right to left, and downward. The leftmost, E and F, also went back to front, right to left, but they went upward. And what do those different directions indicate to you? To me, they indicate that she would have to be impaled with the rake at least twice. And when you say at least twice, can you tell exactly how many times she was struck? I cannot. You could consider one penetrating wound for each of these injuries, but at least twice, possibly three times. And why do you say possibly three times? So puncture wound D, the bottom most puncture wound, if you think about the corn rake with the tines in succession, the one under her armpit, B and C, tend to be in a line, and those all go in the same direction. That bottom most puncture wound also goes in that direction, but to consider that within the line of the tines on the corn rake is difficult. So to me, it possibly represents a third strike. So doctor, based on your exam, can you say, can you say that um, Amy Mullis' body was struck at least two times with the corn rake? Correct. Possibly three? Yes. Doctor, what caused Amy Mullis' death? So, thinking about the puncture wounds that entered the chest cavity, when something penetrates your chest and you remove that object, you create a hole that allows, allows air to go into your chest cavity. When it also penetrates the chest cavity and it goes through the soft tissue between your ribs, it injures blood vessels that are there. So she had the injured blood vessels in addition to her injured right lung, and that's leaking blood into her chest cavities. So the combination of the air and the blood put pressure on your heart and your lungs, which are in your chest cavities, and that pressure 
really restricts the function of your heart and your lungs, which are very important organs in your body. So without any sort of therapy to relieve that pressure, death will occur. Oh, doctor, I'm going to show you state's exhibit number 61. What is this a photograph of? This is a photograph of the corn rake that was brought to the autopsy suite, and there was a photograph we took of it. Now, when you were talking about um, your exam and your belief that Amy was struck two or three times, mm -hmm. you talked about the line, um, you indicated the line that the puncture wounds were in. Exactly. And did you base that um, exam ba or on this corn rake that you were able to observe? I did. And did you take this photograph? I did to show you state's exhibit number 62. Is this just another angle of the corn rake? It is. It's an angle emphasizing the curvature of the tines on the rake. And I'll show you state's exhibit number 63. I know you indicated that Amy's clothing was brought with her. Mm -hmm. Is that a yes? Yes, it is. You also took photographs of that? We did. And so this was a sweatshirt that was brought in a separate bag, which we removed and documented and photographed. State's exhibit number 64. What is this a photograph of? This is of a gray long sleeve shirt that Ms. Mullis was reportedly wearing um, at the time she was injured, so we photographed this as well. And state's exhibit number 65. What is this a photograph of? This is a pink jacket that Ms. Mullis was also reportedly wearing at that time. All of these clo the clothing items, the shirt, the sweatshirt, and the jacket all showed blood staining, which you can see on the left side of the picture, and they also had defects that corresponded to the wounds on her body. No, doctor, earlier when you were talking about in your testimony, I believe that you indicated that one of the purposes of an autopsy is to determine cause and manner of death. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Can you explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what cause of death is? So cause of death, it's an injury or it's a disease process that ultimately leads to someone's death. It can be an immediate death or it can be more delayed, but it starts a sequence of events that ultimately leads to someone's death. And there are numerous possibilities for cause of death. And in this case, were you able to determine Amy Mullis's cause of death? Yes. And what was it? Sharp force injuries of torso. And you also indicated that your part of your exam is to determine the manner of death. Correct. And can you explain what that is, manner of death? So we have less options with manner of death. We actually have five. One is natural. So that's any sort of death that results from a natural disease process. And it's really just describing the circumstances surrounding someone's death. We also have suicide, which means death at the hands of oneself. We have homicide, which is death at the hands of another. Accident, death to, due to unforeseen events. You can classically think of a car crash. And then undetermined. And after, that's when we've considered all options. We've performed a thorough examination, toxicology investigation, and we can't confidently say that their manner of death is one of the other four, then we say it's undetermined. And in this case, what was the manner of death? Homicide. Now, Dr. Cruz, could you tell from your exam um, when Amy's um, blunt force injuries, the ones on her face, her arms, her knees, and her uh, chest area, not the fatal ones on her back, when those would have been, when those injuries uh, when Amy would have sustained them. They hurt. So looking at blunt force injuries when we're trying to determine timing, we look to see if there's any sort of hemorrhage, which is bleeding around those injuries. You're going to have hemorrhage or bleeding when your heart is still pumping. And these all had associated hemorrhage. So I can say it either happened before her death or around the time that she was dying. Cross-examination. Doctor, yesterday when Dr. Thompson was testifying, he described the uh, process in which when the decision has been made to send the body to the state medical examiner's office, what protocol they go through. Yes. And you're familiar with that? Yes. One of the things I recall him mentioning is that her hands were bagged. Uh, is that how she arrived at your office? She did. Okay. And what is the purpose of bagging hands? 
So we classically bag hands if we want to maintain any sort of evidence that we think we might need in cases where we think this might be a homicide or we think having fingernails might be important later on, we suggest bagging the hands. And this contains any DNA or evidence during that transport process that could potentially be lost when they're in a body bag, especially if there's a lot of blood involved. When Ms. Muddles' body arrived at your office and you began your preparations. Did anything that you did there uh, include the examination or the attempt to retrieve evidence or see if any evidence may have existed in her hands, fingernails, that type of thing? May I refer to my... Yes, go ahead. Thank you. So in terms of, we didn't, I didn't do a gross examination of her nails to see if anything was underneath them, but we did do fingernail clippings where we take the top portion of the fingernails with the fingernail clipper and we put the fingernails and the clipper in a sealed evidence bag. And what, what's, what, why is that done? So if we have concerns of a struggle and we think DNA might have come underneath the victim's fingernails from a struggle, taking fingernails might be useful in the investigative process. Do you know whether or not the fingernails taken from Ms. Mullis were uh, examined? I do not. Did anyone request you or anyone else in your office to do so? I do not know. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Any redirect? No, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. You're free you. to go. Do you swear and affirm that the testimony you give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Go ahead and have a seat. State your name and spell it for the record, please. Deb Sherbring. Debra, D-E-B-R-A, S-C-H-E-R-B-R-I-N-G. Go ahead, counsel. Thank you. Ms. Sherbring, where do you currently live? Manchester, Iowa. And how old are you? 62. And which area did you grow up in? Um, Earlville. Are you married? Yes. And do you have any children? Four. What's your current occupation? I'm a environmental service manager at the Manchester Hospital. How long have you been employed there? Next year will be 30 years. Now, Ms. Sherbring, did you know Amy Mullis? Um, to see her. And how was it that you knew Amy? Amy worked in ER, and I would go in there and clean. And when you say in the ER, was she, she worked in the emergency room? She worked in the emergency room as a nurse. It, at uh, Regional Medical in Manchester? Correct. The same place you've been at for 30 years? Correct. Do you know when Amy started working there? I do not know the dates. Did you have a friendship outside of work, or were you social with Amy? No, I was not. I see her in the hallways and small talk, nice weather, whatever. And did at some point did Amy stop working at Regional Medical Center? Yes, she did. Do you know when that was? I do not. After Amy stopped working there, did you maintain a relationship or friendship with her? I did not. Did you see her at all in those in that time? I would say in the last five years, I might have seen her once or twice at my granddaughter's ball games. Now, Ms. Sherbring, uh, sometime at the end of August 2018, do you remember a phone call that you had with Amy? Yes, I do. Where were you at when you had that phone call? I got off work that day, probably around 2 or 2.30. I was home and on my front porch working with flowers, and I received a phone call. Do you remember what time of day it was? I'd say 3.30, 4 o'clock in that area. And was anybody else present with you when you received that phone call? No, I was home alone. Did you have Amy's number in your phone? I do not. What have, did you answer the phone call or did you get on the phone? I had, I received a phone call and um, I was outside and I couldn't really see who called. I did not have my glasses on. So when I picked up the phone, um, Amy was on the line. Did you recognize Amy's voice? Um, she was crying hard and screaming and all frustrated. And I 
did not know for sure if it was one of my kids. And um, so I asked who this was, and she said Amy Mullis. Did you continue to talk with her? Yes. What would you describe her demeanor as when you were on the phone with her? She was just very upset. What was Amy saying? She asked me if I hear any rumors about her, and I said no, I did not. And being as I worked at the hospital, she was crying that she said she was having an affair and it wasn't true. And if I heard any rumors at the hospital, please stop them. I did ask if I was saying something, and she said no, but being as you work there, I think you hear things and please stop them for. Did you, do you know why Amy called you? I do not know. I thought because, I, I don't know, I think she was looking for someone that worked at the hospital. Because prior to that, had you heard any rumors that Amy was having an affair? I did not. During that conversation, what did, uh, did Amy say anything additionally to you? Yes, Amy was all upset and she was crying that if her husband Todd would find out that he would kill her and she kept screaming that several times and then she said um, if Tristan if oh you do not know what it's like to have Tristan tell you if dad finds out you're gonna have an affair you're gonna he'll kill you and then I did not know who Tristan was did you say anything to Amy at that point I asked who Tristan was and she said my son and so did you know um did you know who todd was i knew who todd was how did you know who todd was todd went to school he's a little older than i think my son so they went to the same high school while amy was saying these things to you did she remain hysterical and upset yes sometimes she... i could not understand what she was saying no, I know that you indicated that you asked her what her name was, and she said it was Amy Mullis. Correct. And while you continued your conversation with her, did you recognize her voice? Yes. I have nothing further. Cross-examination. Ma'am, how many years do you work at the hospital? Next year will be 30. So you were working there during the years that Amy worked there? Correct. Uh, we understand from other testimony that she left her employment there approximately five years ago. Does that sound about right? I would not know. There's 400 employees, and I don't know when they come and go. <laughs> All right. Um, You indicated that when she called you all upset about this, that you had not heard any rumors about her. I did not. Okay. And you don't know why you were picked out to be called by Amy? I do not. I, the only thing I can think of is because I worked there and she was, she kept, she repeated many times, if I hear anything at the hospital, please stop it. And so I figured she was just looking for someone that worked where she used to work. And you don't know why she was concerned about these rumors? I do not. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you, ma'am. You thank can you. step down. Please state your name and spell it for the record. Angie Burr, A-N-G-I-E-B-U-R-R. -R. Make sure you speak into that microphone so we can hear you. Go ahead, counsel. Thank you. Ma'am, how old are you? 35. And what area do you currently live in? Earlville. What area did you grow up in? Earlville. What is your current occupation? A lab tech. Where do you work at? Manchester Family Vision Center. And are you married? Yes. Do you have any children? Three. And how old are they? 11, 7, and 6. Did you know Amy Mullis? Yes. How did you know Amy? Um, our daughters are friends. When you say your daughter. Friends, and then I'm friends with, was friends with her at the time. 
Amy's daughter, Taylor, yes. was friends with your daughter? Yes. What's your daughter's name? Malia. And how old is Malia? 11. Did you and Amy become friends? Yes. And, and how long have you and Amy been friendly or friends for? Five years. Did you know Todd Mullis? Yes. How did you know Todd? I just knew of him. We went to school at Maquoketa Valley. When you say you were friends with Amy, what kind of things would you do together? We went to movies. We went out to eat. We went to the pool together. We went to each other's houses. How would you communicate when you would talk with Amy? Usually on the phone. Did you ever hang out with Todd Mullis? With Amy. And in what capacity? When we would go to, um, I think two times we went out to eat, and then a couple of times we went to there on the hill. They had bonfires. Do you remember a day um, in the fall or near the fall of 2018 when Amy sent you a text message? Yes. Do you remember what day that actually was? I do, no, I do not. Do you remember, is there, what do you remember about it? It was like football season for high schoolers. And uh, do you recall, was school in session or was it summer break? School was in session. And I know you indicated that you would usually talk to Amy. Sometimes you text as well. Yes. And you received a text message from Amy that day? Yes. And what did it say? Call me. What did you do then? I called her. And why did you, or when you called Amy, what did you observe? She was upset. I could barely understand her. And she was crying because Tristan did not want to get on the bus that morning because he didn't know if she was going to be there when he got off the bus. And said that Todd found out about an affair, and she wanted the rumors to stop. Now, during this conversation, um, was did it, what was Amy doing? I have no idea where she was at. I'm sorry, what were you observing of her behavior? She was upset and hysterical, and I just couldn't hear. All I could hear was she said something about Tristan not wanting to get on the bus and something about an affair, and she wanted it to stop. And Did you know what rumors Amy were, or what Amy was talking about? No. Did she say anything to you at that time about having an affair? Just that the rumors needed to stop. And did she refer to what the rumors were? An affair. Now, um, Ms. Burr, another time where you had a bar with Amy, um, where you had a conversation with her? Yes. And do you recall when that conversation took place? When? Yes. It would have been winter time on a Friday night. So would it be, a Amy's death was in November 2018, correct? Yes. Would it have been the winter before that? Yes. And do you recall what month it would have been? It was probably one of the first Fridays in January. And was anybody else present for that conversation? No. What if I, Did Amy t relay any information to you about her relationship with Todd? Just that she could never leave him because she didn't want to leave the kids. And did she tell you um, if she was happy or unhappy? She said she was not happy, but she wasn't going to leave him because she didn't want to leave the kids. I have nothing further, Your Honor. Cross-examination. <clears throat> Excuse me, Ms. Burr, um, how did you and Amy become friends? I mean, how did you cross paths? Our daughters became friends. about how far back would you say it went when it became just your daughters being friends to where you and Amy as parents became friends? Two years. Okay. And at least on a couple of occasions that involved you and your spouse and Amy and Todd going out to dinner? Yes. And your family being invited to some ground where they'd have bonfires. Yes. That was on the Mullis farm. Yes. And you're saying that this call that you got from Amy where she was frantic, upset and talking about rumors, you, your best 
measuring stick is that it was school was in session and probably football season. Yes. But you're telling uh, the jury today you had no idea what she was talking about. No. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you, ma'am. Nothing further, Judge. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. You're free to go.